Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Rick and Morty Season 7, Episode 3, Air Force Wong, a play on the 1997 Harrison Ford film Air Force One, where a president with low approval ratings turns into an action hero to win the public back and lives on as a proof of concept for Harrison Ford to return as the president of the MCU in Captain America 4, even though Air Force One has the worst age CGI airplane crash, the climactic scene. Let's break down all the Easter eggs, the inside jokes, the animation details that you might have missed in this episode of Rick and Morty. It if you're in the LA area, New Rockstars is going to be doing a live show on November 16th at Brain Dead Studios. Come hang out with me and with Tommy and others from the New Rockstars team. Ticket info in the description. The episode opens in therapy with Dr. Wong, voiced by Susan Sarandon, returning from the Pickle Rick episode of season three. Rick's emotional progress is really at the center of this episode. Our man is growing. She asks, though, if he is a hologram. He is, but he's actually just under the couch, retrieving a bag of Funyuns that he left there last week. So while it seems at first like he's been using holograms to fill in for these sessions. The fact that he was there last week shows that he has been coming to therapy regularly, which is such good news. It's actually pretty funny to me that the opening line of this episode is Before we move off this topic, can I ask if you're currently a hologram? So they were in mid-conversation. She was talking to a hologram and began to suspect that something was off, and the whole time they were having that conversation, Rick was behind the couch looking for those Funyuns. But Rick gets a call from President Curtis, brilliantly voiced by Keith David, who has returned in at least one episode per season ever since Get Swifty in season two, but I would say this right here is the first time the show deconstructs his and Rick's transactional relationship in a way that weaves the president into the mythos of the show. And how perfect is it that he comes into contact with Unity, a concept based at least in part on John Carpenter's 1982 The Thing, which many view as Keith David's breakout role. The president explains, In 1961, the CIA secretly relocated the Loch Ness Monster to Lake Erie and replaced her bones with titanium. She was then bit by several werewolves giving us the ultimate anti-submarine weapon. Got it. But the Soviets smuggled in a leprechaun who turned Nessie's bones into silver, giving her the wear version of AIDS. She sank to the bottom, and we assumed she was dead, but she was only asleep. Now she's awake and hungry. It's all very stupid. It seems to be kind of like a Godzilla kaiju situation, but a 1961 CIA operation totally recalls the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba in April 1961. That was the failed CIA plot to overthrow Fidel Castro, an embarrassment at JFK, even though that mission was planned before he took office. But this whole Nessie operation makes it seem like the Bay of Pigs was like a false flag to distract from the real plan, to turn Nessie into a ridiculous weapon to combat Soviet subs, and yeah, using titanium bones for Nessie, a very possible nod to the Weapon X program of giving Wolverine an adamantium skeleton, and this is just two episodes after the show's Hugh Jackman season premiere that said that that would kill all the future Wolverine references. We didn't make it that long. I just love this idea though that the Americans used a Scottish folklore creature while the Soviets used Irish folklore of leprechauns, and this would be in the 1960s, a decade when the Troubles began in Northern Ireland. Like, the KGB might have used that political strife to get the Irish to strike against NATO allies, but I guess that would all be a prelude to another Harrison Ford political thriller, Patriot Games. I clearly grew up in a Tom Clancy family, and I don't apologize for that. Now, during all of this, while everyone else in the helicopter is holding onto the straps for stability, Rick casually leans back and just munches on Funyuns holding on to nothing, because he is the most experienced person in the universe when it comes to staying level, reminding us of one of my favorite cutaways from Morty's Mind Blowers. Perfect level. Lambs to the cosmic slaughter! <laughs> we learn the president is into Dr. Wong. And we also learn that his bodyguard is a Scientologist. Don't be a space Mormon. Why not? It's silly. Sorry, it's a cheap shot. Worship how you want. I like Tom Cruise. Yeah, this is kind of an inside joke among Hollywood comedy writers that everyone knows Scientology is a cult, but everyone is also afraid to go too hard against them because surprisingly, a ton of very powerful people in the industry still have ties to the church. From Tom Cruise to John Travolta to Elizabeth Moss, Will Smith has denied it. Remember, South Park went after the church in its famous Trapped in the Closet 2005 episode, but The Simpsons can't really make Scientology jokes because Nancy Cartwright is a Scientologist. Really, just spend enough time in Los Angeles, you'll be amazed how entrenched it is. Like, take classes at UCB, right across the street, is the Celebrity Center. And everyone who's mad at UCB for not putting them on a Herald team is very quick to say, oh, Scientology owns the least, the Franklin Theater. And that's why they had to take down that one sketch that likened taking classes at UCB with being part of Scientology. And it's hilarious for me to talk about it because the entire new Rockstar sales team is made up of former artistic directors of Los Angeles comedy theaters. So Rick and Morty watch Mr. Stabby on Interdimensional Cable. Mr. Stabby has swords for limbs and a sword nose. Why do people get tickets to his tapings? It's a famous says culture. Yes, the obsession with fame and with cult of personality is the deeper theme of this episode. Also, this gag reminds me of my all-time favorite Simpsons bit, Gentle Ben. Let's have less Homer Simpsons and more money for public schools. Ben, I have a question. No, Ben, no! The 
president summons Rick again. We've got a situation in the state of Virginia. Bigfoot. That's Montana. Nazis. That's uh, everywhere. According to Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, there have been 53 credible Bigfoot sightings in Montana, but Virginia has 86. So not a far off guess from Rick. For what it's worth, Washington state leads the pack with 713. And yeah, reference to Nazis in Virginia and Nazis being everywhere, a nod to the Charlottesville events of 2017, an event that many, sadly, like the president's general here, excuse as very fine people being on both sides. Ugh. The president brings up Virginia's state slogan, Virginia is for lovers. And the state actually adopted this slogan in 1969, appropriate because this was the summer of love and you know, 69 is a sex number. The slogan was actually created to attract young people to the state and has graced millions of ironic t-shirts over the years. But Virginia here has declared itself exclusively for lovers. The screen shows everyone kissing and the bus reads next stop love. And since I made fun of a uh, UCB in the LA comedy community a moment ago, I gotta shout out comedy bang bang and Drew Tarver's hilarious Martin Sheffield Lickley bit, which this absolutely reminded me of. All aboard the train of love. <laughs> We're going full steam ahead. Choo choo. The caboose is full of broken hearts and the conductor is a kiss. But the president is suspicious of anything with 100% approval rating. America knows and incinerates a cult when it sees one. Yes, a very dark reference to the Waco siege where a cult standoff between the Branch Davidians and government agents ended in a deadly fire. So we meet the dream team of Fleet Flap, who might be able to tell the future, Onyx, a rock creature who's apparently a weapon specialist, and Chi Chi, a smart fridge looking supercomputer whose name is written as Chi Squared. But Fleet Flap's possibly prophetic drawings recall the guy from Heroes who could paint things that end up happening in the future and like the kid in every horror movie, but they draw Rick being mauled by Bigfoot. And let's see what happens later this season because I would love to see this pay off later down the line. The Virginia governor says, but the rest of your country doesn't need Virginia's love right now. You know, the last time a state talked that way, we had to have a whole thing. Yes, a reminder that Virginia sided with the Confederacy in the American Civil War and General Robert E. Lee formally surrendered to the Union Army at the Appomattox Courthouse in the state of Virginia. While Rick had the president saved in his phone with a presidential seal, the president saves Rick as Rick, goddamn spaceman, with a photo of the two of them posing in front of the Loch Ness Monster. Apparently, they caught it just with a fishing rod. That's all it took. But I love this detail because remember, at the end of season three, episode 10, after Rick's brawl with the president, Rick returned turns as fly fishing Rick, claiming to be a different Rick, and uses that to repair his friendship with the president. So I just love this idea that Rick may be keeping up this ruse and only helps the president in ways that involve fishing. The governor's tour of the utopian Virginia reminds me a lot of like, anytime we saw a new community in The Walking Dead season six, like whether it was Alexandria or Jeffrey showing his farm community, but this leads to the president calling them communist bastards, but then he changes his tone. All goods are freely given. Communist bastards. And all goods are freely made. Communist bastards. Yeah, the tone shifts to positive, which might just be how like politicians respect the American tradition of farming in the abstract, but scowl when, you know, they can't find a way to tax and profit off of the farming. But the cultists begin vomiting to assimilate them. Finally, your religion comes in handy. Oh, no! My only chance of meeting Will Smith! Okay, so Will Smith, let's be clear about this. While Will and Jada have denied being Scientologists, according to the Daily Beast, they did use one of their residences as a base for a school that the former headmaster of said was a Scientology academy. Academy. Like L. Ron Hubbard was in the curriculum. There were pictures of L. Ron Hubbard up around. So this is just what they said. Also, Leah Remini said that she would often see Jada Pinkett Smith at the Scientology Celebrity Center. You know, the one across the street from UCB. And Jada has said that she studied Dianetics, but was not a Scientologist. So make of that what you will. But either way, I just think it's hilarious that the president of the United States thinks that this would be his only way of meeting Will Smith, despite earlier saying he could pull up everyone's genome. Now, longtime New Rockstars viewers know how much we use geology and how long we've been using it for, but if this is your first time hearing about geology, get ready for blockbuster quality skincare on a student film budget. Geology is a 23 time award winning skin, hair, and body care company recognized in Men's Health, Oprah Daily, Hypebeast, Birdie, Esquire, and GQ. Geology's products are just a handful of powerful, proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Geology can help you fight acne, reduce oiliness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes, have smoother, hydrated skin, and target signs of aging. Everything you need to keep your skin healthy, no matter how much you soak in the pool this summer. Don't know where to start? Geology can create a simple and effective skincare or hair care routine for you. All you gotta do is take a quick 30 second quiz. Right now, if you use the code NEWROCKSTARS100, Geology will give you 
20% off their award-winning skincare trial set. You'll also get an additional bonus offer of up to 30% off one skin, hair, or body products when you add it to your trial. It's truly a wild offer, one of the best they've ever given our audience. So click the link in the description or go to G-E-O-L-O-G dot I-E slash Rockstars 100 to get started. Rick recognizes this as the doing of Unity, the hide mind voice by Christina Hendricks. That's one part John Carpenter's a thing, but also with her space station is absolutely a take on the Borg hide mind from Star Trek. She was first introduced in season two, episode three, auto erotic assimilation. And Rick's whole history with Unity, I and others have argued in the past, mirrors Dan Harmon's history with the NBC sitcom Community, which gets a shout out in that season two episode. But the fact that Rick now has his defense against Unity ready to go shows us he's still been thinking about them in the past since their breakup. Rick calls his defense separation, obviously the opposite of the word unity. And by the way, for what might be the most in-depth deep dive on John Carpenter's thing and some hot takes that the alien entity in that movie is a communion seeking protagonist who views McCready, the Rick of that story as the cancerous toxin, check out my analysis on the deep dive channel, which is now live for you to watch and enjoy. So earlier Rick told Unity that Dr. Wong was part nutritionist. So later when Dr. Wong starts going off about being a nutritionist, that's how Rick knows that she was assimilated. So we learned that Unity is doing this though, because she is worried that Rick is looking for him after he almost died last time, referring of course to Rick's renewed search for Rick Prime, the Rick who killed his family, a plot point that came back at the end of season five and continued through season six and in these little background details throughout season seven. But the president activates a dome around the entire state of Virginia. Virginia is not dome shaped, but I guess somehow it just kind of works with the Virginia borders, putting a dome over a residential area. This happens to Springfield in the Simpsons movie and in the Stephen King story turned CBS series Under the Dome. The dome emits from an orb that rises out of the Virginia Washington Monument in the city of Richmond in the public square. This statue pictures George Washington at the center and then around him, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, Andrew Lewis, John Marshall, George Mason, and Thomas Nelson Jr., all of them founding father Virginians. The news anchor Shonda criticizes the president. This president has been in office for how many alien invasions? Not to mention the mutant turkeys, the abandoned White House orbiting our planet, the eco-conscious dinosaurs. Yes, she's referencing season five, episode six, Rick and Morty's Thanks Exploitation Spectacular, season six, episode 10, Rick Schnell, Mort Poons, Rick Miss, Mort Cation, and season six, episode six, Jerixic Mort. Rick ejects all of his go-go gadget weapons at once. We see a boxing glove on a spring, a kind of boomerang, an energy blade, and then a ballot. And I believe on the front of it, it says recall referendum, which would be a great anti-politician weapon. However, federal elected officials like the president cannot be recalled by popular vote. They can only be impeached or just lose reelection or like die in office. Recalls are only in effect for certain states for like statewide offices like governor, state legislators, things like that. Unity calls to warn that the people in the dome are cut off from her and thus vulnerable to another mind to form a new colony splintered off from her. And Rick makes fun of her for needing a PowerPoint. And I just appreciate the meta joke from the writers here because the writers probably felt like we, the viewers, needed a visual aid to understand how the president could take control of these masses later. And they just kind of hang a lantern on it here. Rick tells Unity, I'm sorry you lost a finger, but that's the price of surprise butt play. As in, I am sorry to cut off your limb of hide mind members, but you snuck up on me in this orgy pile. And I also wonder what interspecies orgies Rick would have been in in the past where participants lost a finger that way, like some butt had teeth. Dr. Wong dumps the president and he doesn't take it well. There's an exit tunnel by the ladies room. It gets lots of use and not just by sex workers. Yes, a callback to the Kennedy sex tunnels in the McKinley hooker dump that the president referenced in season three, episode 10. Rick yells at Summer. When's the last time you saw your therapist? Today! Well, then she sucks. No shit! Well, stop yelling at me! I need boundaries! Well yeah, Rick is incorporating therapy lingo into his everyday life, and he does apologize after she slams the door. Later, he'll tell Summer that he did apologize, he just did it quietly. But this moment reminded me of that debate earlier last summer around Jonah Hill using therapy speak, and specifically the word boundaries in a very messy context. Like, look, therapy Therapy is good, but just because someone goes to therapy and talks about going to therapy a lot, doesn't mean that they're not still capable of continuing to hurt people. And they don't get a free pass just because they went to therapy. The news zooms in on the president, insecurely watching himself on the news live. There's no amount of spectacle is going to undo his last debacle. Shonda? Mm, not Shonda. She hates me. And I love how they put a slight delay on his lips moving on the news feed on his phone, as it would have a delay in real life. So the president bails on his plan once he realizes that he can get a 100% approval rating if he turns America into a hive mind. He eats their puke. Holy shit! 
Yeah, because the president is still adjusting to running a hive mind. He can't yet speak through one drone at a time and he just kind of has to speak in PA mode. But this part of the episode is why it's my favorite exploration of the president character on Rick and Morty so far, because he's not just a one-off joke about his ego or his rivalry with Rick. I see your asses playing Minecraft. I got you on satellite. Or the United States military industrial complex. But the way modern presidents and seekers of the presidency have been so insecure, addicted to validation, obsessed with social media. Like presidents now operate as cult leaders who want electoral maps to be solidly 100% their party's color when that is never going to happen. And I don't think from here forward, we're ever gonna see that again in our lifetimes. We are in such a polarized time and there seems to be something really, really scary about presidents having smartphones and personal Twitter accounts. And I love that they choose Virginia as a setting. It works especially well for this whole social experiment because while the state of Virginia has started to lean blue in certain recent election cycles, they also most recently elected a Republican governor. It's still considered a swing state with a mix of conservative and liberal voters, and you're just never going to get 100% approval for any political leader in the state of Virginia. And maybe it's on the nose, but I love how this conformity is spread person to person by vomiting into each other's mouths. The puke in this case is a duller shade than Unity's was, and it shows how this hive mind support of any political movement is just us spewing the worst of ourselves into each other. Rick tells the kids, you kids stay inside and lock up. Dad's still out shopping. Then stay inside, lock up, and plug your ears. Remember, it's season three, episode five, Rick locked down the house and Jerry was left outside in the yard. As Dr. Wong goes down this road, among the fleeing people is a mom who takes her baby out of the back seat, but there is no car seat. And one of the guys who swarms the car has a 69 shirt, as his hive mind is a big pro-president orgy. Aboard Unity's ship, we see a bunch of alien crew members that are all part of Unity. If you look closely, notice they are all blinking in unison. Very creepy, but awesome attention to detail. These aliens include a few Zygerians from season one, episode four, along with that big red alien in the t-shirt who said that Rick was taking Roy off the grid in Morty Night Run. Holy shit, this guy's taking Roy off the grid. <sighs> and later we see a tuskfish alien species that's known as the Smupians. Unity's fleet approaches Manhattan, St. Louis, Hollywood, and San Francisco. In Vegas, on the Luxor Casino sign, we see ads for what looks like the Blue Man Group and the Amazing Jonathan, a hilarious comedy magician who died last year. Now the Blue Man Group is currently playing at the Luxor as is Carrot Top, who you know what? It's actually really funny live. Unity releases everyone on Earth from the collective and it's just painful for her and for everyone as detoxing from hive mind thinking back to your own thoughts can really be a difficult transition. And it's just so sad to see everyone immediately revert to their phones and road rage and Buzzfeed clickbait articles. Top 10 literally popular things to low key love. After Unity says she doesn't trust Rick, he returns to the garage and grabs some foamies from his fridge. Inside that fridge are a few other snacks like some slime colored eggs and alien eyeball. And I'm thinking individually packaged pickles in case you ever wanted to ditch therapy again. I'm pickle Rick! Though he apparently has not, so good on him. Also on the shelf is that Doc Brown style colander with the mind switching headgear from last episode. Rick listens to Unity's voicemails that recalls Jerry's answering machine from season three, episode nine, because who really has just answering machines anymore? And we end with a cheerfully threatening message from David Miscavige, head of the Church of Scientology. Hey Rick, David Miscavige here. Heard you were saying some really great things about Scientology. If you ever want to meet Travolta- And playback! We don't want to meet Travolta, but where's Shelly? Now in the post credit scene, Mr. Stabby is being interviewed by Gary, an alien version of Larry King. Now Mr. Stabby is voiced by legendary voice actor, SpongeBob SquarePants, Tom Kenny. Your show has resulted in the deaths of 58,000 attendees. Well, you're talking about it. But I love this line. It's a perfect summation for the deeper theme of this episode, how the masses are just gonna inexplicably flock toward things that will hurt them. Please support us by grabbing one of these Loki inspired shirts. We're all gonna die from nerdriot.shop. See you all in Los Angeles for our live show on November 16th. Big thanks to Jordan Morris for his help with writing this breakdown. Subscribe to all three of our channels. Follow me at EA Voss. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.